unanticipating to understand the future. I'm Tanya Hall, and my guest is Dr. David Weinberger, senior researcher at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center and writer in residence at Google Pair. Welcome, Dr. Weinberger. Hi, Tanya. What does Google's Pair Group do? Talk a little bit about your background and your relationship with Google and Harvard. So I've been at the Harvard Berkman Center for about 15 years. It's a, it's really a wonderful center for internet research. Um, Google Pair stands for People and AI Research, is a small research group in Cambridge, Massachusetts that uh, works on issues of the sort of human uh, AI interface. Uh, go ahead. I, I'm embedded here as a writer in residence for a while anyway. <laughs> Lots of uh, research and, uh, angles for you. You're about to release your latest book, Everyday Chaos, Technology, Complexity, and How We're Thriving in a New World of Possibility. Why is it good that we're confused? <laughs> it's good that we're confused because the world is very big, very confusing, very complex. Um, and we have little tiny brains that have massive numbers of neurons and connections, but the world is just much, much bigger than we are. So if we're not confused, then we're really sort of not paying attention. We haven't been confused enough. We've developed over, over millennia a set of strategies for dealing with the fact that our capacity to understand is so limited given the vastness of the universe that we're trying to understand. Um, but now we are developing, we have some experience on the internet of being overwhelmed, um, I think in, often in very positive ways. Um, yes, I'm gonna say positive things about the internet and about AI. I know that makes me very unusual today, but that's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and fearlessly do that. I think the internet has taught us a lot of very positive things about the experience of being overwhelmed. And um, AI, especially the form uh, known as machine learning, is giving us models of the world, the domains of the world that are so complex that we cannot wrap our minds around them. Um, yet these models work. And so I think we are beginning to learn the lesson that the world is so deeply complex and we can begin to accept that. And the first step in accepting it is to be really, really confused. Define unanticipation and what benefits does that offer? So uh, from the, our paleolithic strategy and continuing up until very recently has generally been to try to anticipate the future and then to prepare for it. Um, we, we try to narrow the possibilities that the future offers us as it comes forward until we get the one that we want. And we do this by anticipating. And, you know, we do this all the time. Um, certainly do it in product design. We have done it in product design forever. Um, be, uh, one of the great examples of this is, uh, is Henry Ford's Model T, which he designed once in 1908, basically made no visible changes to it for 19 years and sold 15 million of them because he just nailed it. He knew what people were going to want. But on the internet, for a variety of reasons, it turns out that we can uh, we can hold back from anticipating in really useful ways. And this shows up in lots of different areas on the internet. Uh, one of the ones familiar to you know, the Valley is the concept of the minimum viable product in which you launch a product very much unlike the, the Model T. It's a, exactly the opposite approach. You launch your product with a minimal set of features that you think the market will want. So you do the least anticipation you can, and then you see how they react, how the market reacts, what users want to do with it, what they need from it, um, what new ideas come up, and you start building them into your, into your product over time. So you get tremendous benefit because you know that, the, as a company, because you know that the features are ones that your market wants, because they're actually asking for it, instead of having to guess and maybe go wrong. Um, so you get this tremendous benefit, but you get this benefit by holding back, for, by unanticipating. Um, there's another sort of example, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, lots of different products and services on the internet open some, <laughs> offer some form of open platform, an open API by which developers are able to 
tweak the product, add on to it, or integrate it into other products, into other pieces of their, of their workflow, of their client's workflow, which makes these, uh, these packages, these software products, way more useful. A platform, when you, when you go to the trouble as a company of building an open platform, which takes some work um, and some investment and some commitment, you are holding back from, you, you are recognizing that you cannot anticipate all of the uses and situations in which people may want to use your product. So you, you encourage this, you enable it, you give people tools so that they can do things with your product that you would never, ever have anticipated. And this is this sort of approach is, uh, occurs throughout the internet. And it's great, uh, but we should recognize just how unusual, how foreign this is to thousands and thousands of years of assuming that the right way to secure the future is to anticipate it correctly and to prepare for it. Nope, it turns out that unanticipation actually works really, really well now that we can do it. What's the story of Deep Patient and what lessons should we take away from this? Uh, deep patient is a type of deep learning um, system, which deep learning is a type of machine learning. Um, this uh, 2015 Mount Sinai Hospital in New York took 700,000 patient records, about 500 data points in each record. So that is a lot of data. Um, and they ran it through a deep learning system. So the normal way, as, as you know, the normal way that you program a computer is if, it's, um, if you're going to do a program that's going to help with diagnosis or something, you would tell it what you know about how disease works. You would tell it, uh, here's a list of medicines and correlations to, uh, uh, to symptoms and here are outcomes and patient uh, parts of patients, you know, bodily systems and all the stuff that we know. That's, and then you, you program in the connections between them. Um, and that's how you program a computer. We've been doing that for you know, decades now. Works really well, obviously. With a deep learning system like Deep Patient, you take this data and you don't tell it what you know. You just give it to it as a gigantic bucket of numbers and you ask the system to start finding its own correlations. So you, you don't give it the existing model that we're carrying around in our heads. You just give it the numbers. It finds correlations among these numbers, um, vast, vast, vast numbers of these correlations at various strengths. It builds, um, represents these as a neural network, and then it can make diagnoses. Um, it can predict the onset of diseases. And some it predicts better than humans can, more accurately than human doctors can. And, and in some cases, it predicts some diseases that humans simply we just can't yet predict the onset of. What's a, the many things that are amazing about this sort of, this is just an example of one deep learning system. It's the sort of system, the model that it makes, that these systems make, can, do not necessarily come up with the sort of generalizations or broad principles or laws that we have used to organize our thought for thousands of years now. We've tried to come up with the overall picture and the, the big, these systems can consist of um, relationships that are so complex and so delicately balanced and a change in one little number can potentially cause a ripple effect that has very dramatic effects on the outcome is the butterfly effect. Um, it doesn't fit into our normal way of understanding the world. It doesn't necessarily reduce to big broad principles but it works better. It, we're using it, these systems when they work better. This type of um, refraining from generalizing and simplifying so that we with our, our brains can understand it can um, create systems that are better than we are at predicting what will happen. I think that we may be learning from this that the ways in which that we have tried to understand the world by simplifying it, by organizing it into principles, works really well in many instances. I'm not gonna argue against um, that sort of thinking, but they are simplifications that keep us from the fact that the world is, everything in the world affects everything else all the time in one way or another. It is a, a densely impossibly complicated universe that we live in. We're getting better at recognizing that because now we have te technology that can take advantage of that. It is complicated. And, and so a roadmap is, is difficult. So how should we prepare for the inevitable digital disruptions then that our businesses and society will no doubt face? 
Well, I, that's such an important and large question. Um, the, the, the part that I want to focus on is the extent to which businesses can embrace this complexity rather than simply trying to reduce it to what we can understand. Um, this is the amazing thing about some deep learning, some machine learning systems, that they work, but we cannot necessarily understand them, at least not in the normal way that we think of, of understanding. Um, it seems to me that that is in fact not a, just, it's not a flaw in the system, it is, it is our situation in the world. So to the extent that businesses are able to accept now the, the complexity of the environments that, the, that they're in, of the lives of the employees who are working for them, um, recognize how delicately balanced all of the, all of the factors in our environment are. You know, you know the idea of, of black swans, um, a black swan being an event that can disrupt, out of nowhere your business is disrupted because uh, a supplier's factory burns down or somebody comes along with two kids in a garage, do it better or whatever. Um, that's absolutely, that's a really important idea. What I'm hoping is that businesses begin to recognize that it's all black swans all the time. It's black swans all the way down. That the world that we live in is complex beyond understanding. Um, and chaotic in the sense of uh, being unpredictable. And I, what I really hope is that one of the ways of, that they, businesses take up one of the ways of addressing this, which is to um, embrace the benefits of unanticipation when possible, holding back from trying to guess, trying to predict what's going to happen next. They can do this in various ways on the, um, on the internet for sure. It's a great environment um, for doing that. But I think the concept begins to change your idea of what it means to have a strategy. Um, changes your idea of, the, um, of trying to filter information so that you have only enough that your mind can process. You actually need more than, it, more than that. You need to be overwhelmed by information because that information reflects truths about the world. And so being open to that sense of being overwhelmed, I think, it, it, and being humbled by that, I think is a really healthy development for businesses and also for us as people. Good advice, Dr. David Weinberger, senior researcher at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center, writer in residence at Google Pair. If somebody wants to connect with you, David, maybe they actually want tips on selecting the perfect fountain pen, or maybe they want a copy of your book. How can they do that? <laughs> I'm D. Weinberger at Twitter, and the book site is everydaychaosbook.com. Sounds great. And if you guys want to find me, you can do so at tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.